Thanks for tuning in. I'm Scott Walter. And I'm Michael Watson. In this episode, courageous demonstrators in Iran lead us to look back on the Obama administration's Iran deal, which strengthened the mullah's regime, as well as the echo chamber, their term, not ours, that propped up the deal. This is the Influence Watch podcast. Since last week, demonstrators across Iran have called for the overthrow of the Shiite Islamic theocracy that has ruled the country since 1979. President Trump, Vice President Pence, and the U.S. State Department have all expressed support for the demonstrators, who have taken over 20 fatal casualties from the regime's security forces. Closer to home, the demonstrations have reopened debates on the 2015 Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, an Obama administration agreement, better known as the Iran deal, that was supposed to get the Iranian regime to stop development of nuclear weapons in exchange for sanctions relief and the release of the regime's seized financial assets. The Iran deal was backed by what Ben Rhodes, a former Obama National Security Council aide, called an echo chamber of nonprofit and advocacy groups, many of them backed by the well-financed disarmament group Plowshares Funds. Now, uh, as we speak, Mike, these demonstrations are occurring uh, in the streets uh, across Iran, but tell us a bit about Iran, the country. Sure. Uh, Iran is one of the larger uh, larger countries in the Middle East, a uh, population of a little over 80 million. Uh, what makes it distinct from much of the rest of the Middle East, North Africa region is that it's religion is not Sunni Islam, which is the majority, fact, majority sect, uh, but is Shiite. Uh, well, it goes back into long, long, long ago uh, Islamic theology on the succession of who's in charge of Islam. Um, so the Shiites went one way, the Sunnis went the other. Uh, Iran is ma- majority Shiite. Uh, the uh, majority ethnicity is also not Arab. Uh, they, are, they are Persian. Um, in the majority, also, there are minorities uh, of Azeri Shiites. Uh, there's a, a minority of Kurdish Sunnis. Uh, and then there are small minorities of, non, uh, of non-Muslims and of other uh, Muslim ethnicities. Uh, since 1979, when the, there was an Islamic revolution, the country has been ruled as a authoritarian theocracy under, under Shiite clerics. And it has been extraordinarily hostile to the United States and to the United States' allies, uh, specifically Israel and Saudi Arabia. The, uh, the government is nominally run through a supposedly elected legislature and a ostensibly elected president. However, those come, those come with massive asterisks. The real power resides in the supreme leader, who is a Shiite cleric, and a guardian council of Shiite clerics who can uh, reject the candidacy of member of uh, individuals running for offices uh, throughout the Iranian ostensibly political system. Uh, the current supreme leader is a guy named Ali Khamenei, uh, who succeeded the leader of the Ir- Islamic Revolution, uh, Rula Khomeini, when Khomeini died in 1989. Uh, the president uh, is Hassan Rouhani, who is also a Shiite cleric. Uh, who has held numerous positions in the Iranian government since the takeover in 1979. Uh, This system has, not just now, but also before the current uh, cycle of of, uh, dissent, has seen multiple mass demonstrations against the government. Uh, In 2009, the nominal election was seen to be in the eyes of... uh, moderate opposition forces who, although didn't want to overthrow the government, uh, did not believe that their election had been fair. They believed that the then-President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad had stolen it. They were probably right. Uh, There were massive demonstrations. Um, Those demonstrations are a little bit different from the current round of demonstrations. The current round of demonstrations have been have gone into the working classes. The 2009 demonstrations were largely the upper middle class, uh, and the 2009 demonstrations were not explicitly for regime change. And the current demonstrations 
uh, the demonstrators have been open to and have explicitly, they've torn down uh, propaganda posters of Khamenei. They've, uh, they've chanted for the end of the Islamic Republic. They've, some have even called for the bringing back the Shah. Who was the leader who was before? The, who was the mm-hmm. yeah the 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 Shah's dad or the the current pretender's dad was the was the leader uh, before 1979. Um, this has become an issue in the United States because of the negotiations surrounding the Islamic Republic of Iran's nuclear program. The uh, the the mullahs have for years and years sought uh, nuclear weapons. They are widely suspected to be at least fairly close to getting them. And in 2015, the United States, through the Obama administration and also the Europeans, negotiated this Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, this Iran deal, uh, by which the U.S. and Europe agreed to lift most, if not all, of their sanctions against the Iranian regime for its nuclear activities in in exchange for the regime... Uh, agreeing to a limited regime of inspections and ostensibly rejecting its pursuit of nuclear weapons. Now, the um, you, you pointed out that the protests have gotten to the point that they're now even calling for regime change. Um, the protesters uh, seem to share some of the concerns about Iran's military misadventures that are not nuclear. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. Uh, so the, the protests kind of broke out in the, a couple, uh, over the last couple of months over the, ba- over the bad economy, uh, specifically food inflation and the price of eggs, which is in, uh, in poorer countries tends to be an important source of animal protein. Uh, when the price of that goes up, all of a sudden you're, you're unable to afford proteining those calories. Um, and then there have also been protests about political corruption. By the end of December, uh, the last kind of the last week of December, right before the new year, they had spiraled into mass street demonstrations calling for the Supreme Leader to resign. And one of the more interesting uh, chants that some of the demonstrators were chanting uh, was, not Gaza, not Lebanon, my life only for Iran. Uh, part of the, of the Obama administration and the Europeans thinking behind the JCPOA, behind the Iran deal, was that, okay, we'll give Iran all this money, and it'll give up its nuclear weapons program, and then it will reinvest all its money into its domestic economy, and they'll care about their domestic economy, and they won't go meddling in the affairs of other Middle Eastern countries. And that did not happen, which is, why, which is part of why the demonstrators, you know, the, the, the New York Times and the media outlets that are more pro-Iran deal uh, and have pushed a less a less hostile view of the regime have tried to you know hand wave all this away as though it's just economic protests. Well, the thing is, the economic protests are the political protests. It's the same the same germ. Yeah, the, the regime is not focused on the the simple is, the reg- improvement of life. The regime is not focused on the improvement of life. The regime is not focused on ensuring that I can afford eggs. The regime is too busy meddling in Gaza and too busy meddling in Syria and too busy meddling in Iraq. And, and that has been, I, I, I think, a somewhat underreported uh, facet of the protests because it is, in addition to the nuclear, the nuclear issue, the problem for the United States and for the United States' allies that Iran causes is that it is an expansionist, revisionist power, uh, seeking to rewrite the rules of the game, especially in the Middle East, but throughout uh, throughout Asia. And if the people are saying, no, we must come home, we must make Iran great again, that is a, that, that could yield an, a notable shift that would be in our interests without even necessarily us having to do anything to effect it. Yes, and of course, you mentioned the, the, the misadventures of the regime abroad. In a way, uh, the Iranian regime operates somewhat like an impressive uh, foundation itself, you could say, in a grim kind of way, because they like to fund things. What are a few of the things that the Iranian mullahs like to fund? 
Uh, the most important one is probably the Lebanese Islamist militia Hezbollah, which now effectively runs Lebanon. Uh, the among the things that ir the uh, the Iran the Iranian government and the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps, the IRGC, which is one of the the sword and shield of the Isra Iranian Re Revolution, basically the secret pol the kind of hybrid secret police. KGB. Army, they're kind of like a KGB or, a, or an SS. Very nasty guys. Um, one of the one of the things that that they have backed Hezbollah in doing is meddling in criminal activity in Latin America. Uh, and the U.S. in 2014 was had a very aggressive operation to try to break up Hezbollah influence in Latin America using law enforcement. And it was reported shortly before the protests broke out by, uh, by Politico that as part of the Iran deal negotiations, or as the Iran deal negotiations are going on, the Obama administration deprioritized and effectively shut down that operation, which made Ben Rhodes very angry that people had pointed out that they had given these concessions to Iran. And that's... Yeah, that's Ben Rhodes... The this sort of lead propagandist within the Obama National Security Council. Yes, he was he was the, the deputy deal. deputy national security advisor for speech writing, um, and he and he was kind of the orchestrator of the echo chamber, and he named it the echo chamber in an interview uh, with the New York Times Magazine after it had succeeded after the after the Iran deal had been enacted. Um, the what had been, um, you know, the, we had, we had this, the, you know, this operation, it had been set aside, and that kind of speaks in, in a mini, in a microcosm of the problem with the Iran deal itself. The concessions that the West made to Iran were made all up front. Most, the most infamous concession was, in, was money again. Uh, involved quite a lot of money, uh, quite a lot of cash, and a jet. <laughs> the pallets of cash. <laughs> pallets of cash on a jet. The uh, the U.S. agreed to release certain regime assets that had been frozen because of the regime's various crimes, uh, among them, you know, killing U.S. servicemen in Iraq, pursuit of nuclear weapons, uh, you know, suborning terrorism abroad. Part of our concession was we were going to give them all, the, give them a bunch of this money that we had frozen, and for four hundred million dollars of that money was literally flown to Iran on a, or was literally flown to the Iranians. I believe the handover occurred probably in Switzerland. Uh, was flown to the Iranians on an airplane, in cash. So, uh, better than most any foundation could manage, even. <laughs> um, so, well, let's uh, now that we've. Uh, gotten back to the, the Ben Rhodes and the echo chamber. Um, the, the echo chamber that Ben Rhodes s successfully constructed was needed uh, because of all kinds of opposition to the Iran deal as the negotiations were ending. So take us back to that time and, and uh, tell us a bit about some of the folks who were ar arraigned against the deal. Sure. The the Obama administration's Iran policy was based on a fundamental misunderstanding of how the Iranian political system works. The Obama administration and its supporters operated under the assumption that there are reformist factions within the regime uh, and that the current Iranian president, Hassan Rouhani, who has ordered a violent crackdown that has killed over 20 people, was a reformist and that there were he was opposed to hardliners like the former president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, and that if we empowered the reformers, that they would give up nuclear weapons and they would give up foreign adventurism. Uh, just about everyone else was extremely skeptical of that assessment. Even including some Democratic members of Congress. Including Democratic members of Congress. Among them, if I recall correctly, Senate Democratic leader, now Senate Democratic leader, uh, Charles Schumer. Um, to say nothing of what allies to ours to like is Israel and the Saudis. The, the, <laughs> is, the Israeli government was militantly opposed. Uh, 
Prime Minister Netanyahu was invited to the to, to Congress by then. I think Boehner was still speaker then. Speaker Boehner, yep. Uh, and Majority Leader McConnell, and he gave us you know he gave a speech saying the Iran deal will be bad. Uh, obviously, Republicans were opposed uh, because of the Republican af- uh, affinity for Israel and also uh, the Republican assessment of how the regime operates. Um, and again, a handful of Democratic members of Congress uh, were skeptical enough to vote against it in the in the Senate. Now, the problem was that the Obama administration realized that they were not going to command even a majority to say nothing of two-thirds necessary to ratify a treaty. So they concluded it as an executive agreement, which Congress cannot do anything about. The Congress knew that the Obama administration was going to do this as an executive agreement, so they created this Corker-Cardin law that would allow I think it was a two-thirds majority to override the executive agreement. Uh, they didn't get two-thirds. They got, I think, 58 in the Senate uh, and a majority of the House. Um, but what this shows is you know, there was bipartisan opposition to this agreement, bipartisan opposition to the Obama administration's Iran policy in general. So the Obama administration, to prevent even more Democrats from defecting, created this echo chamber. Uh, and then, uh, so uh, Rhodes, ben, ben, ben Rhodes, the Deputy National Security Advisor, put forward this, uh, this echo chamber using Plowshares Fund, this longstanding uh, disarmament nonprofit, to fund all all of these liberal national security foreign policy organizations who would then make, you know, who would then bring forward what, uh, what would later be called in the interview with Rhodes, freshly minted experts who could come out and say, no, 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 the Iran deal's fine. You know, the mullahs are going to give up their nuclear weapons if we do this. And the Obama administration does have a solid head on their shoulders. Yes, and, and of course, uh, as wise Washingtonians know, uh, and careful observers of the news, uh, one of the scariest sentences uh, is always, experts say, uh, <laughs> because you may discover that the experts, in fact, know uh, very little, or even if they actually have genuine expertise, their wisdom may be somewhat lacking compared to uh, less self-important folks. Uh, but, of course, the critical ally of the echo chamber's freshly minted experts was the media themselves. My favorite part of that New York Times magazine interview with Ben Rhodes, and by the way, we should at this point insert, uh, his brother is also a profound influencer. His brother is the president of CBS News then and now. Um, But anyway, uh, this is Ben Rhodes' opinion, uh, to speaking in the New York Times, of the media folks who were talking to him and his freshly minted experts. The average reporter we talk to is 27 years old. They literally know nothing. Yeah, now the, that, uh, you know, Rhodes and the, echo ch- and the echo chamber that he and Plowshares built were looking to take advantage of these fresh out of college sort of cub reporters who many of them sympathize with the Obama administration for ideological reasons, but all of them were maybe young, were young naive and maybe didn't have the back didn't have the background to know even who they should go to to get a, a sound alternative view yep now there also were uh, folks who f- regularly are uh, pop up in our influencewatch.org website and that is the semi-governmental uh, semi-straight media shops uh, like NPR. So tell us a bit about the role that they played in this mess. So among the things that Plowshares was funding during the debate over the Iran deal uh, were, a, were numerous media outlets. Some of them were openly partisan left-wing. Uh, Mother Jones, the San Francisco-based labor movement, uh, left-wing journal was one of them. 
uh, but also some ostensibly non-aligned media. They gave $100,000 to NPR. Uh, they gave substantial funds. Yeah, and to, we should add $100,000 not to NPR in general, but to th- with explicit notation that it be for coverage of uh, of the Iran negotiations. Um, and then they also gave money to the Center for Public Integrity, which publishes the website ProPublica. Uh, NPR, later there was a little bit of controversy. The Washington Free Beacon found out that uh, congressional Iran deal critic Mike, po- Mike Pompeo, who is now the director of the CIA, uh, had been essentially blackballed from giving, uh, from, in, from interviews on NPR. Uh, NPR tried to wriggle out of it by saying, well, they never contacted us. And uh, the Washington Free Beacon had emails that said otherwise. And to then say in- nothing of the fact that, of course, if you were NPR and you were legit, you would be going to the most articulate spokesman on both sides. You, you, you would think. Um, so there was, so there was some criticism. There was uh, criticism there, and some suspicion that that the involvement of Plowshares' money may have inclined them to disproportionately fa- show voices who were in favor of the Iran deal as opposed to those who were opposed. Yeah. Now, the uh, more recently, another, this is a, a, a sidelight to this, but there's an amusing additional financial incentive that has popped up for why a very prominent uh, news outlet might like the idea of uh, warming relations with Iran. Can you tell us about that? So the New York Times runs, in addition to its newspaper, a sideline business in travel uh, travel package tours. Uh, one of them is a 13-day trip to Iran. Uh, it will set you back $7,895 per person at least. Uh, and obviously, if the U.S. and Iran are at loggerheads, the odds of uh, having of selling successful package tours goes down. <laughs> yes, there's a. Th- this is similar to the far left uh, magazine, The Nation. Uh, does tours to uh, Cuba, to the former Soviet Union, to Vietnam. I don't think they've made it to North Korea yet, <laughs> but uh, though I'm sure somebody is, uh, has, uh, no, no, is plotting North, that. North, at North some Korea, point. you have to go through the regime, so that's uh... <laughs> that might be a little tricky. But uh, it, it, you know, if it, it sounds in a grim joke way, it sounds a bit like uh, selling tours to the favorite Nazi spots in Argentina to me. But anyway, uh, plowshares. Uh, this big pass-through entity for funding, they didn't just fund all the types of folks that you're talking about here. They also funded the ostensible expert think tanks. Right. This is, this is where the, the experts got freshly minted. Uh, they were giving six-figure grants to groups like J Street and J Street Education Fund, which is the left-wing uh, Jewish interest organization. Uh, they gave a six-figure grant to the Friends Committee on National Legislation, which is the uh, Religious Society of Quakers, very pacifist religion, gave money to their, uh, to their policy arm. Yeah, and we should add, long, one of the national religious groups long active um, on the left side in foreign policy since at least the 60s. Yeah. Um, they gave uh, money to, liber- uh, to liberal-leaning national security policy shops like Center for New American Security, Atlanta Council of the United States. Uh, They gave money to other arms control groups like the Arms Control Association. Uh, And then, perhaps most controversially, they gave money to the National Iranian American Council, which has been credibly accused of having very uncomfortably close ties to the regime and to apologists for the regime. Uh, And uh, bringing it back Tying it, tying it all up nicely together, Ben Rhodes, uh, when he was still in the Obama White House, spoke at the National Iranian American Council's 2016 Leadership Conference. Yes, that's, that's a little spooky. They also gave uh, money to, um, uh, have given money over the years and still are doing so, uh, because we should make clear, this, this is not something that just happened uh, back in 2015, they, they right. are it's, continuing it's a, to fund support. Right, it is. It is a. Iranian. It is a. It is a very live issue. Uh, President Trump has decertified portions of the Iran deal. Uh, it will come up again when uh, 
in fact, as, I think as early as next week, they have to decide whether sanctions are going to be put back in place on the Iranian Central Bank. Uh, many uh, conservative uh, foreign policy people are saying that those sanctions should be put back into effect. The demonstrators have actually uh, um, have protested against uh, the Iranian banking system because the Iranian banking system control, you know, controls the flow of money for the regime, for the regime to do all this foreign adventurism. So the, you know, plowshares in the echo chamber are still trying to preserve this, uh, the, the Iran deal. And, you know, again, why would, you know, above and beyond, you know, ideological reasons, why would they care? Well, the Obama administration, the, the old Obama administration guys see the Iran deal as the centerpiece of their second term. That, you know, they had Obamacare in the, in the first term as a domestic policy legacy, and then in the second in the second term, the policy legacy is supposed to be the Iran deal, which reorients U.S. policy in the Middle East. Yep. The Trump administration, however, has been elected, and they favor a more traditional, conventional American foreign policy in the Middle East aligned with Israel and Saudi Arabia. And, of course, the Trump administration's I ideal would be to foster the great rapprochement between Israel and Saudi Arabia to counter Iran. Certainly, and I, I should add, as somebody who spent a little time in the White House halls, that <laughs> legacy is a word that has great resonance uh, during and after administrations. Um, and uh, if our uh, listeners and viewers want to have an idea of just how vigorously political um, uh, plowshares and its many aligned groups are to this day, uh, if you go straight to the Plowshares website, one of the things that will hit you is a impassioned plea to support the, uh, the group Vote Vets, which is one of Plowshares grantees and it's allies. A, and and let's, let's be clear about who Vote Vets are. Vote Vets are a 501c4 uh, social welfare advocacy group, ostensibly of veterans. I use ostensibly for a reason. Um, that backs Democrats and liberals. Yes, and on the Plowshares' own site, which, by the way, it is a, to repeat, it's a C3, which has some ability to lobby, but it generally is not supposed to be... 501 five, five, C3s have limited lobbying ability, limited formal lobbying, but they are not supposed... That, that not only cannot be their primary, uh, primary activity, it's, in fact, much tighter than that. Yes, that's very limited, but you wouldn't know that if you went to their Vote Vet, the, the page on the Plowshares website, uh, pushing you to join Vote Vets lobbying to support the Iran deal. And I'll just give you a line or two from it. Vote Vets knows pressure works. When the year began, many people assumed Obamacare wouldn't survive to the summer months, but Americans spoke up, citizens called, they wrote, they demanded, etc., etc. So just as you should be lobbying hard to keep the Obamacare legacy for the Obama administration, so you should be lobbying your congressman and the rest for uh, the continued life of the Iran deal. Well, we've talked about what Plowshares gives money to, but of course, Plowshares itself has to raise money. So talk about the, the uh, let's connect some of the dots right. of the money going into so, Plowshares. So Plowshares has a lot of money of their own. They have about $40 million of assets, but they're also raising uh, between six and ten million dollars a year, and a lot of that money is coming from the the left wing the left wing foundation world. Uh, the biggest contributors are Rockefeller Brothers Fund and the Hewlett Foundation. Rockefeller Brothers Fund gave them two million in 2015 alone, and I believe much of that was earmarked for their Iran work. Uh, also, get money from Skull Global Threats Fund, Proteus Fund and the Foundation to Promote Open Society, which is one of the George Soros philanthropies. Yep. Uh, and I wanted also to reinforce a, uh, an earlier point you made about the uh, how the Iranian Revolutionary Guards are active all over the place. I, I realize some Americans may say, well, you know, I'm sitting here in Iowa, and the Middle East is, is a mess. It's always been a mess. It's always going to be a mess. Why do I really care? Um, it is shocking how much closer to home than you may realize these things are. Um, uh, the, when I was at the uh, special ops headquarters um, for Latin America and the Caribbean, I was shocked at how many, I believe that the exact number is classified, but let's just say it is well into the double digits in the Caribbean and Latin America where there are outposts 
of the Iranian and, regime. And, and, this is, and this is why the Department of Justice had a strong counter Hezbollah program until 2014 when the Iran deal was being negotiated. Yes, exactly. Well, so, uh, well, let's, let's step back for a second and think about the bigger picture here. Uh, if you had to make predictions about the poor folks uh, struggling in the streets across Iran, uh, what do you think the outlook is? Uh, I regret to inform you that it's probably not very good. Uh, the protests have been disorganized. That's an advantage because the regime can't just decapitate the organizer. But the the Revolutionary Guards have been ordered to crack down. People have already been killed. Uh, the regime has the ability and has exercised its ability to crack down on communications. Uh, the uh, uh, Telegram, is a, which is a, an app that is popular in that part of the world, uh, was cracked down upon. Uh, there was some question as to whether the, uh, the American owners of Telegram were improperly collaborating with the regime in its crackdown. There are laws, go, there are laws governing that, and that may pop back up in the future. Um, but the, the regime is, is a brutal regime. It is a brutal authoritarian regime. It has behaved in a brutal and authoritarian manner, uh, and it can be reasonably expected to continue to do so. And the Trump administration uh, and folks like a UN ambassador Nikki Haley, uh, they, on the other hand, have been uh, pushing back. The 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 U.S. Uh, the U.S. administration has done a commendable job, unlike the Obama administration did in two thousand and nine. Uh, the uh, the Trump administration and its foreign policy uh, side have done a commendable job in showing uh, at least rhetorical support, uh, diplomatic support for the uh, for the demonstrators and for their cause of regime change. Um, uh, Ambassador Haley called for a special session of the UN Security Council uh, to discuss the expected crackdown. Whether that will be honored, you know, whether that will be honored, the UN is not a is not a good organization when it comes to protecting human rights. Um, it, you know, we will we'll see what happens, but uh, the the administration, at, at least rhetorically, at this point, and you know, many members of the administration have a pretty sensible view of of the Iranian regime. So potentially going forward in policy, has has done a reasonably commendable job. And sanctions could be reinstated despite the Iran deal of 2015 uh, on perhaps the basis precisely of the vicious repression right. that is already starting and is likely only to get stronger uh, to, to, to shut down. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, ab 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 absolutely. Even if the nuclear deal stays in place, which is far from certain, uh, the, the U.S. Could always, could always reimpose sanctions on human rights grounds. Uh, and yet, despite all of this viciousness and uh, and also likely the sadness that it's you know that this latest eruption of protest may in fact uh, flicker out uh, and the mullahs uh, remain securely in power, um, plowshares and their allies, uh, can, as we say, they continue to beat the drums on this, and they don't just beat the drums; they even beat mainstream media folks up on this. So, you want to give us one of the examples of that? Sure. So, as as we as we've kind of been discussing in ten in tangent throughout this conversation, right before uh, right before the the protests broke out, I think it was like right before Christmas, Politico, uh, which is the sort of trade publication for political Washington D.C. And not known as a right of not, center organ. Not in any way considered right wing. Uh, you know, very, very main, very mainstream, very uh, sort of conventional establishment center left in its in its outlook. Uh, published a very substantial investigative piece by Josh Meyer, uh, one of its you know investigative reporters. Not again, not a right wing guy, not uh, not a conspiracist. You know, straightforward, you know, conventional mainstream media, center left, that called out this, uh, this effort by the Obama administration to take the pressure off Hezbollah in Latin America. And Hezbollah, of course, as we have discussed, is one of the big allies of the Iranian regime and the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps. 
And a grantee, you could even say. You, you could say a grantee of the IRGC. Uh, so after this piece, this piece comes out, the president of Plowshares, Joe Cirincioni, ruthlessly attacked Mayer and ruthlessly attacked Politico for having the temerity to suggest that the Iran, Iran deal had had bad consequences and that the Iran deal had been negotiated under less than open, uh, less than open, in a less than open manner. Uh, one of the, again, one of the problems with the Iran deal is that we still, the general public in the United States still aren't quite sure what we gave up. Uh, yes. what, what concessions were made was kept very tight-lipped by the Obama administration. Not in, a triumph of transparency, which perhaps ex, uh, suggests that the plowshares squealing these days uh, is a case of they doth protest too much. You Definitely a case of they doth protest too much. Uh, you know, the, the Meyer piece has been called, you know, was called a, quote, shoddy neocon hit job. Meyer isn't a neoconservative. <laughs> um, you know, the, uh, you know, and plowshares, you know, I, I have to bring up with the with the you know the the, the neocon issue that Plowshares has uh, associated with some nasty anti-Semitic uh, some nasty anti-Semitic people. Uh, Valerie Plame, the CIA, the former CIA officer who was a cause salabra in the two thousands because she was against the Iraq War and then got her name got reve- got revealed by Richard Armitage. Um, Earlier this year, she tweeted out a really conspiratorial anti-Semitic article, uh, and two days later, she had to resign from the Plowshares board because she had essentially endorsed the anti-Semitic conspiracy theory that Jews are responsible for America's wars. Ah. So Plowshares has quite an interesting history. Quite an interesting history. Well, thank you so much for all this uh, good information on it, and for all those in our audience who'd like to learn more about Plowshares, we want to encourage you to go to influencewatch.org, search for Plowshares, and you'll find even more than what uh, Mike Watson here has provided for us. Uh, That's our show for this week. If you're listening to this on iTunes or Stitcher, know that we broadcast a live video version of this podcast at 10 a.m. on Thursdays on Facebook Live and YouTube. And you can find our pages by searching Capital Research Center. If you're watching the video version, we encourage you to subscribe to the audio on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next week.